Today, I'd like to uh, start my message. Uh, are you ready for more? In Luke chapter 12, verse 48. Luke chapter 12, verse 48. Everyone try to find out how to get there. Get there. Look at somebody else. Put it up on your phone. Somebody's phone. Get a Bible. It's important. Luke chapter 12, verse 38. <clears throat> All right, is anyone there? Yeah. Amen. Luke chapter 12, verse 38 says, we're, we're, this is where Jesus tells us, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been trusted with much, even more will be required. Now, I'm pretty sure you guys heard this or something similar in a very popular movie called Spider-Man, where uh, his uncle Ben, yeah, his uncle Ben imparts some words of wisdom to him. He says, with great power comes responsibility. You know, Spider-Man, well, Peter Parker was walking away from the cemetery, I guess, from his girlfriend. And I guess to be, to, to, I'm not a, I don't know at all, because I'm not, I don't follow all the comics, but the bottom line is he's getting ready to prepare himself for his calling as Spider-Man. So he says here again, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, Peter remembers these words later as he's walking away, as I mentioned. And he says, um, oh, which I said already, excuse me. But I say, whatever life holds in store for us, we will never forget these words that Jesus said. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. This is our gift. Oh, you know what? That's where I was going. Okay, scratch that. Bear with me. Follow me. We're here. As Peter was walking away in Spider-Man in the cemetery, he said he would remember these things that his uncle told him, which is the great power comes great responsibility. It says, whatever life holds in store for me, I will never forget these words. With great power comes great responsibility. This is my gift, my curse. Who am I? I am Spider-Man. You follow me? So as he was walking away, that's what he said. So I say, catching up where I started before, whatever life holds in store for us, we will never forget these words that Jesus said, which was when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even much more will be required of them. This is our gift, our blessing. Who are we? We are Christians. That makes sense? That's what I meant to say. Thank you. Now, this is a gift or curse, depending upon who ju who's judging. But as Christians, the only judge that matters to us is God. Amen? And that we should look at this responsibility as a gift, as a blessing. His gift to us as a blessing. Amen? The idea behind this statement, Jesus made to whom much is given, much will be required, is that we are held responsible for what he's, in give for what he's given us. For what he's imparted on us, our gifts, our talents, uh, our, our dancing abilities, our culinary skills, our um, athletic ability, musical ability, whatever it may be, he expects us to be responsible for them, to, be, to, to glorify him, and to be a blessing to others. Amen? So before we can get into using them, for his glory and to benefit others, we have to understand how to be effective in using them. Effective managers and stewards of his resources, his, his gift that he's imparted to us. So we first have to understand the source behind these resources that we have and that he's given us and our significant roles as stewards. So the source is God, we all know that. But let's talk about him for a second. Let's talk about his sovereignty. So I, originally, I didn't know what sovereignty meant, so I looked it up. The dictionary uh, defines the word sovereign, which is the base word of sovereignty, as superior, greatest, supreme in power and authority, ruler, and independent of others. Basically, God is saying he's in control of everything. His hand, his mighty hand, controls everything that we do, everything that we have. And there's nowhere in Scripture... Does it say, well, there's scripture after scripture backs up this claim that he, that his mighty hand 
works in everything that we do, everything that we are, everything in this world. And there's absolutely nothing that happens in this universe without God's hand. So all things derive from him. They come from him, they start from him, and they finish with him. The seen and the unseen. We can't speak to the unseen. That's where faith is required. But what we can speak to is the seen, things that he has given to us, the tangible things. Our Bible, for instance, our family, our friends, our loved ones, our job, our skills, our ability, our gifts, the community, the church. We all have a responsibility, and he's entrusted us to do right by these things. He's appointed over us and gave us the responsibility to be good stewards and good managers. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. And when someone has given you much, much will be required in return. Scripture tells us that we are managers. You following me? We discover that in Genesis 1 where God makes it very clear that he's the sole owner, the founder and the establisher of the universe and everything in it. So turn with me to Genesis 1, verse 26. And I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Version. Genesis 1, chapter, or, uh, chapter 1, verse 26. As God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image, after our own likeness, and let them have complete authority over the flesh of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts, and all, over, and all of the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the earth. It sounds like we have been commissioned. We have been commissioned to fulfill God's purpose and he has commissioned us as his rulers over everything. Again, he's entrusted us over everything for a purpose, right? This is a profound privilege he has given us and this goes way beyond money, property, and material things. At no time in scripture do we ever read about God relinquishing or giving over his power to the people that he's created. Nowhere in scripture. What it does say is that he requires us to be good caretakers, stewards, and trustees over what he has given us, but not owners. Now be very clear, we don't own anything. Now I may act like I do. I own my home, I own my car, it's my house, it's my car. Well praise God, we just paid off our car, so I actually own it. Amen? Amen. But even still, I don't own it. Because God owns it. So we are not owners in any... But we have to remember, God owns everything. Amen? He reminds us of, of, of his ownership in Psalms 24, 1 and 2. 24, 1 and 2. Chapter 24, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to read from the NIV version. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, everything in it, the world and all who live in it, on it, in it, that's us. He founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. That's God's sovereignty. That's his sovereignty, excuse me. His sovereignty is further reinforced in Psalms 50, verse 10 and 12, or 10 through 12. For all the animals of the forest are mine, and I own the cattle on the thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains. All the animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for all the world is mine and everything in it. I mean, that's deep. He owns, controls everything. And even everything doesn't really justify everything. So what is he saying here? He's saying that in no way is he dependent on any man because he is self-sufficient. Think about that. When we talk about being self-sufficient in his sufficiency, we serve a God that is self-sufficient. So when we, when we talk about self-sufficiency, we're dependent on God. We get everything from God because he is self-sufficient. And our self-sufficiency our, our sufficiency comes from him. I mean, that's amazing to be attached, to be linked to something that amazing means we have no needs. We should never want for anything because he gives us everything. Amen. He continues to remind us of his glory and ownership over everything in four ways. So remember these or write them down. In four ways. Number one, he spoke all things seen and unseen into existence. 
Psalms 33, 9. I'm just going to reference some scriptures that should be up on the screen soon. But if you can follow me, just follow along here. Psalms 33, 9. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. That kind of rhymed. Number two, he maintains his position of authority over all things. We read in 24.1 that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Number three, he exercises his right and discretion over all creation. Psalms 103.19 says the Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there, he rules over everything. He's reiterating that he is the owner. He commissions the stewards, the managers, to enact his will. That's us. That's his disciples. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says, Jesus came and told the disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of, t- of the age. So his disciple teaching us as disciples, we go out and teach and show other disciples. It's a continuation. So we have a duty to fulfill. What is this all saying? It's saying God is the who of stewardship. And he has commissioned us and gave us the right over, to, gave us the right to manage for him. Are you following me? Our primary responsibility is to the one who has entrusted us with his possessions. Think about that, his possessions. He's entrusting us with his possessions. He has called us to be good stewards and managers over everything he has entrusted us with. So how can we be good stewards and good managers? Well, we first have to understand what it is to be a steward, a manager, and our roles. So we're going to dive in and get an understanding of this. So look, let's look up the word steward. Well, I looked up the word steward. So the dictionary defines the word steward as a person who manages another property or financial affairs, one who administers, one who has charge over a household, or directing servants. That's what a steward is. The Greek word for steward is okinomos. Okinomos means steward, manager, basically. Steward, manager are one and the same. Administrator, referring mostly in the New Testament as the law of management or administrator of a household affairs. So what are household affairs? Turn with me to Luke 12. We're going to read 42 to 44. This is a great example of managing household affairs. And this is right, before, this is right after Jesus gave a parable, a story, a, a prophetic utterance, Um, to his disciples preparing them for his return so in Luke 12 41 Peter just asked Jesus he says was this parable he just gave I'm going to get to 42 but he asked Jesus is this parable that you just gave for the disciples and everyone else well first of all when when we read this he's talking directly to the disciples and he's saying this for all mankind so when you read it what I'm about to read, read it as if it's talking directly to you, okay? Jesus answered with another parable which describes this, a faithful and wise manager, one who gives out food and other, and other allowances at a proper time. So a wise manager, a faithful manager. We pick up in Luke 12, 42. And the Lord replied, a faithful, sensible servant, one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a great job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put the servant in charge of all the master owns. Amplified Version says, he will set him in charge over all his possessions. You following me? Now, possessions could be anything, anything that God has given you or allowed you to have to be good stewards over. Amen? Amen like our children, okay, something real simple but meaningful. Our children don't belong to us, they belong to God. 
but we have the responsibility to manage them and be good stewards over them and raise them in the word of God. Amen? That's what his words say. Raise them up in my way, not our way. Like your job or school, life in general, if anyone has placed you in a position of responsibility, then you should be responsible. And as we look in the Bible, the master saw that his servant was responsible. So he said, I will give you a reward. And with a reward comes responsibility. I'm going to give you more. So he, based on his managing and stewardship, he received more. Now, this doesn't mean you'll always have the possessions you want, when you want them, how do you want them. But the parable is designed to show you the effectiveness of faithfulness. And faithful servants of Christ will be rewarded. That's what the word says. The word says that we will be rewarded based on our stewardship, how we're managing what God has given us. So let me give an example. I give an example, and I, I give this example because home ownership is the American dream, and everybody one day will hopefully be blessed to own a home. But let's say, let's say you are renting an apartment, okay? You're paying bills on time, you're doing right by the apartment, and you're cleaning the apartment, and God rewards you and puts you in a better position to buy a home. So now that you buy this home, now what do you deal with? Is it a bigger home? Not necessarily, not necessarily bigger, but you have more responsibility that comes with this home. You have more utilities, right? More bills to pay, taxes, even more taxes than you're paying now. You got the front yard and the backyard to do. You got to clean up your garage. Like I clean up mine. That's like, <laughs> that's like my little man cave. It's spotless when you come over my garage. I love my garage. <laughs> Too much, exactly. Not more than you, though. Amen. So anyway, more utility. So much given, much is required, right? Sort of like more money, more problems. More money, more problems. Not more, but more. More money, more problems. Amen? The more money you make, the more responsibilities you have. The more you want to do more, the more you want to buy, the more bills you have, the more things you have to take care of, the more you have to manage, the more you realize that what your parents told you about the responsibility that would come with more, you wish you would have slowed down and listened. Because more ain't necessarily fun all the time. Sort of like more money, more problems. So slow your roll. Too many times we desire more, we gather more, we want more. Lord, I want more. We're not even doing right by what we have right now. But we want more. We want more like the Joneses, but are we ready to keep up with the Joneses? The Joneses got a lot of money, and they got a lot of problems, and they got a lot of bills. So are we ready for that? Something to think about. But there's hope. When we apply good stewardship over something like whatever we have, we take care of it. We tend to it. We make sure it looks pretty. We clean it. It's all proper. It looks good. God sees that. We don't waste our time with it. We invest in it. It looks pretty. It's sits at our home. We love this. We'll pause for a hot second. But you're, you're getting, so you're following me so far, right? Okay. All right. All these interruptions keep throwing me off. But God is good. All right, so I'm going to say this over. When we apply good stewardship over something, we take care of it, we tend to it, we make sure everything is right, and we don't, it doesn't go to waste. We are mindful of how it's used, who uses it, if we're going to allow you to use it, how we use it, and we want to make sure it's honoring to God. God notices this, you guys, and he rewards us according to more, accordingly, accordingly. He knows and sees this. He rewards us accordingly accordingly to the ability and the level that you are. Knowing that we'll take care of the more. Whatever that more is, he knows that. So when you're rushing into something and you're rushing into more, God knows what you should have. So if you're not having it today, you need to wait. When God entrusts us with privilege of having more, know that it comes with accountability. Write this down. Privilege brings responsibility, and that responsibility entails accountability. Privilege brings responsibility, and that responsibility entails accountability. 
So let's turn to Matthew 25, 14 through 30. This is the parable, uh, the parable of the ten talents. Now, I'm going to give this to you. I was at work yesterday. Now, because this is, tw- I'm going to read 14 to 30. So you're going to have to endure. You're going to have to be attentive. You're going to have to listen. Or you're going to have to read it yourself. But I was, you know, God is so amazing. Because I was at work yesterday. And I was talking to this gentleman. He was like, every time I go to church, you know, the pastors say the same thing. Well, I'm not the only pastor that's read this Matthew 25, 14 to 30. And I probably won't be the last. But I told him, I said, you, someone may need to hear it. You may need to hear it again. So you should probably consider going to church when you go to church, if you go to church, to be open, to be expecting. So what if it's a, the same scripture over and over again? What if God, if you don't need it, someone else is going to need it? And I, and I said to him, I said, you're probably the person that uh, goes to church sitting in the back with your arms all like this. Oh, what the pastor going to say now? And he says, you know what, you know what, Andre, I am. I said, there you go. But you got to go expecting. You got to come expecting. So I'm going to read this long scripture, but pay attention because it may be something that someone needs to hear. Amen? So the parable, I'm going to set this up. The parable of the Ten Commandments, Ten Talents, continues the theme of being ready for the Lord's return. But it makes a very strong point that we are accountable to the Lord for what he has given us, okay? This is also where Jesus is delegating the responsibility that comes with being stewards of God's kingdom. He impresses upon the Israelites and the disciples and all the mankind the weight of this responsibility. So get ready. Here we go. For it is like a man, I'm starting at number 14, for it is like a man who was about to take a journey And he called his servants together and trusted them with his property. To one, he gave five talents, probably about $5,000, and probably even more than that today. To another, two. To another one. To each in proportion to his personal ability. Remember that. Then he departed and left the country. He who had received the five talents went out once and traded with them. And he gained five talents more. He went out invested it and gained more. Amen? But he who had received the one talent went out and dug a hole in the... I'm sorry, did I skip? And likewise, yours. Okay, thank you. But he, who had re- who, but he who had received the one talent went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of the servants returned and settled accounts with them. It's time to settle the score. And he who received the five talents came and brought him five more, saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, here I have gained five more talents. Woo, he's making a lot of money. His master said to him, Well done, you upright, honorable, admirable, admirable, and faithful servant. You have been faithful, trustworthy over a little, over a little apartment, over a little car. Enter and share the joy, the delight with your master, which your master enjoys. Uh, chapter, uh, verse 22. And he also, who had two talents, came forward saying, Master, you entrusted two talents to me, and I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, you upright, honorable, admirable, and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy with, over a little. I will put in charge of much you in charge of much. Enter and share the joy which your master enjoys. 24. He who had received one talent also came forth saying, Master, I knew you to be a harsh and hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you had not widowed the grain. So I was afraid. I went and hid your talent in the ground where you have what is your, is your own. But the master answered him, how are you going to assume this, man? You wicked and lazy and I... I threw that in, excuse me. You wicked and lazy and I don't serve it. Did you indeed know that I reap where I have not sowed and gather grain where I have not widowed? Then you should have invested my money. You should have what? Invested what? Money, time, your abilities, your skills, everything that God has given you. With the bankers. 
We all know what I am, so come on. <laughs> and at my coming, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take this talent away from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, who has will more be given, who, will, oh, who has will more be given, and he will be furnished richly so that he will have an abundance. What? But from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away and throw the good for nothing servant. I didn't say this. Jesus said this. Throw the good for nothing servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Anybody want to go there? And that's a whole nother service. So I don't know really what the punishment was, but it must have been heavy. Here the master gives a considerable amount of money or, or responsibility to each servant in keeping with the servant's abilities. Remember, he gives us based on our abilities. For the two servants were faithful to care for their master's money. They were rewarded accordingly. There we go. Accordingly. The third servant lacked faith, and the master saw this as worthless. He lost what he had, and he was punished. Now, in my studies, I really don't know what punishment, what it was, whether he was, he was killed or whatever the case may be. It's not for us to figure it out. The bottom line is what you're supposed to do what God gives you. Amen? And I'm sure that'll be another service at another time. But what we gather from this is God gives talents and gifts to every person. These talents vary from person to person. So my gift is going to be different from your gift. Amen? My ability is different from your ability. It doesn't make it my ability being, you know, more than yours or yours and mine. It's just our abilities are different. Amen? However, whatever we are given, we have to give account of these gifts to who? The owner of them. So, I don't have to give an account to you. So, ain't nothing to be scared of. But to give an account to him, that's some fear. Good fear, though, because we want to do right by God and what he's given us. Remember, we are held accountable to what God has given us. And since Jesus was referring to the kingdom of God in this parable, we learned that our lives are not our own. They are not our own. We live according to our wishes. They're not ours. So we can't live according to our wishes. We have to live the way God wants us to live. Amen. We owe our lives and owe our wealth to God, okay? And as for Christians, like those stewards, listen to this, like those, like us as Christians today, living like these stewards, I lost my, okay, I was on a roll there, but like those stewards, faithfully using their master's assets while waiting for his return, that's what we're doing. So it's a time frame on what we have, because you know you can't take it with you with you. I'm reiterating, you can't take it with you. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Father, for your words. These servants were accountable to their master for their stewardship, just like Pastor Timberly and I, okay? We are accountable for our stewardship over what God has entrusted us with, right? Now, let me tell you, God is so good because he knew that in our own strength and our ability, we couldn't do a darn thing, okay? So on the real is because his strength in us, are we able to do what we're able to do? He gets all the credit. Andre doesn't, Timberly doesn't, amen? And this came with a great responsibility. Write this down. It's another one. This is another nugget that you can take out and use. Listen to this. This is here. This here is a great responsibility, and with this responsibility come accountability. And that's not what you're supposed to write down, so don't write that down. It's the next one. Sorry. <laughs> Woo, I'll be on a roll. Sometimes I lose my place. Guys, you know, when I was speaking to this coworker yesterday, he said, man, you just so much passion, so much fire. 
You know, I was like, I'm so passionate about this. It was foaming out of my mouth. He's like, man, I see it. So that's what y'all see up here. So anyway. So anyway, this responsibility that God has given us um, came with accountability, not only to God, but to our, to our elders. So when we veer off and we stop and do something that's crazy, our elders, we expect, we pray that our elders would bring to our attention what just happened. But we're responsible for this church and the river, and we are held accountable. So what God has given us, what he's entrusted us with, we're responsible for. Amen? That was my point. Thank you. Hallelujah. Now, you may not have some, someone that governs or watches over you or keeps you accountable, because we know God is the ultimate accountability partner. He's watching us every move we make. But... At the same time, we need someone right here with us, side by side, someone that we would admire, someone that we respect, someone that we trust, someone that's living the word of God in their life as a standard that can kick it next side over and say, hey, you know what? You're veering a little off to this left side. You need to veer back over here to the right side. I love you, but we need to pray because this looks kind of crazy. So someone needs to audibly talk to you. Someone needs to physically be by your side to remind you, it's looking kind of funny. We need to pray. And ain't nothing more powerful than prayer. Instead of me pointing my finger at you, saying what, you're not, what you shouldn't be doing, I'm going to say, you know what, let's pray. Because I don't have all the answers. Amen? So let's talk about accountability. You know, this is something we always talk about. I'm not going to talk very long about it, but accountability is just part of the Christian walk. When you become a Christian, you're held accountable. That's just, it just goes hand in hand. And we talk about it a lot in the Christian community. Amen? But, and it's just part of the walk. So don't get angry. Don't hate me. That's just what it is. It is what it is, which is not scriptural. <laughs> we have to be held accountable to the things of God. And if you, you know we're, if we're not held up accountable, you know what we do. If we're not held accountable, you know what we do. Think about that. You know what we do if your brother and sister's not held, holding you accountable. We know what God would do, but he's not here right now. I can't see him. But we know what we would do without accountability. Amen? Amen. So we see the two ingredients or t, uh, two key components, is responsibility and accountability. Do we not? Responsibility and accountability. Now, we all have a choice. We all have a choice here to how we manage and how we're stewards over what God has given us. Our gifts, our talents, our wealth, how we use our culinary skills. Especially if you cook well, I'm going to eat it. So be careful how you use them skills. Musical ability, dancing skills, athletic ability. Ask yourself the question, are you using them for God or are you using them for man? So a good way to measure this, now write this down. Exactly. A good way to me measure your stewardship is to ask yourself these two questions. There are only two. How am I using what God has given me to glorify him? How am I using what God has given me to be a blessing to others? Now, before you answer these questions, and I'm not asking you to answer them for me, ask them for yourself, but you, what I want you to do here is ask yourself, self, or say to yourself, I'm not going to allow my past or present circumstances to dictate how I am to be a good steward for God. Self, my past is my past, and my present circumstances is not who I am. Self, I am a new creation in Christ. God has called me to do mighty things with what he has given me. So don't measure your, your, don't measure your stewardship based on your past or present circumstances. Our strength comes from him. He gives us all. We can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Amen? So no excuses. Start today. Pray. Seek God. Be accountable. Be obedient. And ask God, how am I supposed to use what you've given me to glorify you and to, glor and to benefit others? Amen? Amen. 
So how many of you heard the saying, um, God won't give you more than what you can handle? We've all heard that saying? Guess what? That's not scriptural. That's not in the Bible. I'm just being funny, but it's not. But it's kind of, it kind of sort of sounds like the scripture I found in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So if you would, please turn there with me or read it off the screen. And I'm going to read it off the screen. There are no unique temptations that are not, are not common to men that we can't bear. The enemy likes to make us think he, there is, but there isn't. However, any temptation we face is just some variation of the same old thing. It may come. Wow, that's not the scripture. Is that the scripture? Okay. It may come. Uh, variation of the same old thing. It may come in different size box, be wrapped in different paper, a different bow, but the contents are the same. Understanding this diffuses much of the power of temptation. Amen? For no temptation, no trial regarded as enticing to sin, no matter how it comes or whether it leads or overtaken you and laid hold on you that it's not common to man. This is no temptation or trial has come to you that is beyond human resistance. And that is not adjusted and adapted and belonging to the human experience and such as man can bear. But God is faithful to his word and he is compassionate in his compassionate nature. And he can be trusted not to let you be tempted or tried and assayed beyond your ability and strength of resistance and power to endure. But with the temptation, he will always, always, always provide the way out, the means of escape, a landing place that you may be capable and strong and powerful to bear up under its patiently. That's what the scripture says. What Paul is saying here is that there are no unique temptations that are not common to man that we can't bear. Now, the enemy would like to think that he, there is, but there is not. There are no unique temptations. It may come in a bow. It may be wrapped. It may be in different paper. It may have a different bow, but the content of this temptation is the same. And understanding that diffuses much of the power of temptation. So we have the strength that we need from him to endure. All temptation is real. Don't get me wrong. And by understanding this, as I said, diffuses the power. So you have the power through Christ to diffuse temptation. You have the power of Christ to get out of a situation. Whatever situation you're dealing with, you have the power. There's a choice. Neil had the left door or the right door. Neil could take the left pill or the right pill. You have a choice. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, this doesn't mean that you won't be tempted. You're going to be tempted as soon as you leave this church. Believe me. But the promise is not the Lord will remove them. The promise is he will provide a way out, a way to escape, a landing place. Landing place is like, I got you. There is no fear because I am the landing, whatchamacallit, the landing uh, strip. Thank you. He is the landing strip. Amen. Our strength to resist comes from him. Our strength to resist comes from him. Our strength to resist comes from him. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. And bear with me here, please. When someone's there, say amen. It says, we think you ought to know Dear brothers and sisters, above the trouble we went, about the trouble we went through in, in the province of Asia, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. They went into Asia expecting to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God who raises the dead. What Paul is saying here is that when they went into Asia, they were under such trying circumstances in Asia that they expected to die. But what he did was through all of this, he stopped. He stopped. He looked to God and resisted the temptation to what? To, to fail, fall, or slip, or to even think he was going to die. And he leaned on the strength and power and the ability through God. 
so much so that it became stronger. So we have to practice every day what we go through, giving it over to God. That's where our strength comes from. Our endurance, our strength comes from him. But God is good because as a result of what he endured, he stopped depending on themselves and started relying on God in hope and God alone who raises the weak. Our strength resists to resist comes from him. Write this down. I got another one for you, and this one you can write down. Our circumstances or what we are going through are only opportunities to stop relying on the abilities and rely on God. I'll read it again. Our circumstances or what we are going through are only opportunities to stop relying on our abilities and rely on God. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, you don't have to turn there, but it says, he said to me, my grace, my favor, my love and kindness and mercy is enough for you, sufficient against any danger and enables you to bear the trouble manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled and completed and show themselves most effective in your weakness most effective in our weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly glory in my weakness and infirmities that my strength or that the strength and power of Christ may rest upon me. Basically, the Lord is telling Paul, look, when you move out of the way, when you move out of the way, trust me, rely on me. I'll come through for you. My strength, I will give you to provide everything you need. No matter what your past or present circumstances may be, don't allow it to dictate your stewardship towards God. So you have a choice. You can choose to be a good steward or not. You can choose to do what you want with it for man, or you can choose to do it for God. So my question is, if you want more, are you prepared for more? If you want more, are we prepared for more? Am I prepared for more? Are you prepared for more? You're saying you want more, but are you prepared? Really think about that. How are you using the resources in which God has given you? I mean, you, you're desiring and wanting a larger place, but are you cleaning the place that you're in already? You want more tennis shoes like Converse, but are you keeping them clean? You got a car. Is it clean or dirty? I'm not calling you out, but think about it. If you want more, you got to be prepared for more. So if you're treating this car, you can't get a car wash, you can't come to Andre's house and, and detail it because I love to detail cars. How are you going to expect God to give you more? Young people, if you want to move out, or the young people that are here, we're all young. If you want to move out, are you preparing a budget? Are you keeping your room clean? What are you doing with your time? Are you spending it wisely? Are you investing in your future? Are you really ready for more responsibility? You want to do more with your life, your family, your wife, for the body of Christ. But are you taking care of your health? Are you eating well? Are you resting? Are you doing a stretch, a push-up or something? Are you yawning, you know, stretching? Ugh. Are you taking care of yourself? Remember, our body is not our own. Scripture tells us that do not, do not think that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. Don't think it's your own. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your, in your body. So does your body honor God? Is your body physically ready to take on the responsibility? When God calls you, you're ready to do something for him. Or you don't have enough energy to go to church. You don't have enough energy to, you know, preach, teach, touch, love someone. What are you doing with your money? You want to travel. You want to go on vacations. You want to go here. You want to go there. You want to buy this. You want to buy that. But are you being wise stewards of your money? Are you being frugal? Are you letting the money control you? Are you ready for the responsibility that comes with more money? Are you giving back to the Lord joyfully, sacrificially, what he has given you? If you want more, are you prepared for more? I'll finally end with this. Whatever life holds in store for you, never forget what Jesus said in Luke 12, 48. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. This is your gift, your blessing. You are a Christian. Let's pray.